get. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Paul Figley, um, he can make an enough announcement, Paul, about what you just found out. Yes. Um, some time ago, I wrote an article on historic iron ore mining in the Kishiko Quillis Valley or Big Valley in Mifflin and Huntington counties. And uh, it's scheduled to be published in Pennsylvania Geology Magazine in the spring edition, uh, which will come out towards the end of March. This is produced by Pennsylvania's Department of Geological Survey. And uh, it's a free publication. Uh, and uh, when we get the, when it's published, I will provide the link in the, the upcoming Zoom Rock Room for that. Um, so it's an article, this is an area in the 19th century, which was well known for iron ores and uh, produced some of the best iron in Pennsylvania at the time. So, and it was very poorly documented in its day. So I did a lot of research to put it together. <clears throat> All right, congratulations and good work on that, Paul. I'm gonna, I'm going to call on Brittany. I'm gonna, I'm going to, uh, she wasn't prepared for this. You wanna put a little ad in Brittany about the box for kids? Oh yeah, absolutely do. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Central Penn Rock Marrow Club does an annual event called Rocks for Kids, and it's really neat. The kids come in and they get to do all sorts of different activities and like earthquakes, fossils. They get to identify minerals, learn what minerals are in everyday products that they use, even the Cheerios that they eat, and they have a lot of fun. And that's going to be March 5th um, at the Lingolstown Life United Christ Church here in Lingolstown. And everybody is more than welcome to bring some kids along. And if you just want to come and see what it's about, feel free to stop by too. All right. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. I'll be there doing earthquakes and volcanoes, I think, as last I heard. So... And I'll be there teaching gold panning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're the one that's taking all the money from me. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so, yep, there are some announcements for you coming up and uh, as we uh, kind of head into the spring. Uh, I do have an announcement about myself. I uh, wasn't going to say anything, but uh, I will. Uh, that uh, Last week, I was tested positive for COVID uh, with my head cold I had. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're doing well. I'm chewing on uh, cough drops here so I don't have to get all coughed up or anything but uh, we're doing well and everything's looking good and uh, I thought I gave it to my wife she had the same symptoms but she was tested negative so uh, uh, I won't get into the I won't get into any more of it <laughs> so anyway uh, so we're going to get started into our program tonight unless somebody else has an announcement you would like to make uh, here and none. Okay. Um, we'll get started here with Earthquake 101 tonight. Okay. And uh, kind of a simple program this is actually part of mostly one of my lectures I do at Messiah University. When we get into talking about earthquakes, this is what I show my, I will show my 16 students in a couple of weeks. Uh, sort of thing. And we talked about earthquakes before in this room, and uh, Dr. Dr. Sean Berger from retired from Millersville. Um, I'm not sure if he's in tonight or not. Uh, he was talking about it, but anyway, when we talk, um, when we get talking about the, uh, when we get talking about earthquakes. Uh, one thing that we always hear the word. It's called the epicenter. Okay, they say that the epicenter was so many miles from a certain town. So what is the epicenter? The epicenter is really the point on the surface above the actual earthquake, called the uh, focus or hypocenter. The focus is actually the, the location of the earthquake. Usually uh, could be shallow or very, very deep. Depends on the geologic setting. But the epicenter is directly above the focus at the surface, and uh, most most earthquakes 
uh, do occur are in faults of some sort uh, where fr uh, friction happens. This is actually a local fault in a York quarry. This, uh, this flat surface right there is a fault that may have had an earthquake produced um, millions of years ago. But uh, faults are very, very common. Not that they all produce fault, uh, earthquakes any longer. You've heard of the ring of fire and the, uh, the theory of plate tectonics has ex explained a lot of things like why do volcanoes erupt where they do? Why do earthquakes happen where they do? It's all explained mostly by plate tectonics. So you see the correlation here with the, the plate boundaries and earthquakes and volcanoes all along these uh, different boundaries of our Earth's crust. Uh, of course, the San Andreas Fault is the most famous fault probably in the world, uh, very distinct, distinguishable in uh, California. And uh, it actually is a plate boundary between the North American plate and the Pacific Ocean, uh, or the Pacific plate. Uh, so why do, why do earthquakes happen? Well, it's because uh, we think now it's called <coughs> elastic rebound theory, where uh, pressure does build up. And basically, uh, over time, the rocks are grinding against each other or actually stuck between each other. And eventually, pressure will build up on one side where the rock cannot take it anymore, and it will uh, rupture and uh, actually uh, move. It could be an up and down movement or a side to side movement. And then, uh, as you can see over here in the last slide, the rocks do rebound to an original undeformed shape, although now our in this case, the fence line is uh, is offset. Uh, so it's fun to look at some satellite photographs and aerial photographs of things along the San Andreas Fault, the roads that have been displaced over time. Uh, an orchard, uh, the trees have been displaced by movement. Uh, and then actually, a couple of cases I have seen also streams uh, come into the San Andreas Fault. It will make a sharp turn in the fault for a distance and go back into its channel where it was. So elastic rebound is is a theory that uh, much of this does explain the uh, occurrence of earthquakes. When you hear earthquakes, you know, oftentimes people uh, you know, know about foreshocks and aftershocks. Okay, and um, foreshocks, of course, are the lesser magnitude earthquakes preceding a major earthquake. Aftershocks are obviously afterwards a, a major quake. And notice on the aftershocks, it can occur months or years, months or years after a major event. And I'm saying years. I mean, some of these uh, earthquakes in California could be aftershocks of, of a major earthquake um, that happened maybe in San Francisco in 1910, for example. Um, so it's just not a very quick foreshock after a uh, foreshock major event and aftershock thing. It can drag and drag on. So it's really hard for seismologists to know uh, was this an aftershock or 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 what. Uh, so the big earthquakes happen uh, along the what, what uh, they call mega thrust faults. In this case, it's a subduction zone where one plate is going down beneath another. And the deepest earthquakes that occur in the world are some 320 miles deep or so deep within a subduction zone. Uh, those are the deepest earthquakes and many times produce some of the largest earthquakes. This is what's happened down at, at Chile. Uh, for example, in South America, that's had its share of major earthquakes. Uh, even in Indonesia, um, where they've had some uh, major events also. Seismology is the study of earthquakes and the waves. 
also uh, a seismologist, of course, is a person who studies uh, earthquakes, and a seismogram, seismograph is the instrument that I will show you here in a second. Speaking of which, here's our seismograph. Uh, these are, this is like the old type of model before the computer day, but you basically uh, plant a, a, a seismogram, uh, or a seismo, seismometer, I'm sorry, in the ground, uh, preferably on bedrock, and then your your seismograph is inside of a building, and as this will move, it will make lines on your on your paper. Now I said this is pre-computer era. Today's computers, uh, of course, are real time. You can go to uh, you can go to a website like from Millersville uh, University or the, the Pennsylvania State Seismic Network and see real-time information taking place. Uh, this is actually a seismograms as recorded in Middletown in uh, 2010. Um, the one on the left is from Haiti in January of 2010 and in February 2010 was a a Chile uh, earthquake, two major events that took place actually only a month and a half apart, as recorded in Middletown, right outside of Harrisburg. So uh, this, you know, this tells, this told the uh, seismologist, um, this is a major event. When the earthquake does happen, there's really three types of waves that are generated. Okay, uh, the body waves, the first one, the, pri the uh, it's called primary waves. It's the fastest moving wave. It's like a, uh, a slinky, a push-pull compressional motion back and forth. P waves do travel through solids, liquid, and gases. And as I said, this, these are the quickest ones. These are the first waves to get to a recording station after an earthquake. That will play a role here in just a second or so. The second one is called secondary waves. And they move like a, um, a radio wave up and down, or if you take the rope as it shows here to, and isolate the rope up and down, that's how a S wave moves through the uh, earth. But S waves only go through solids not gases and liquids. So that's going to be important in just a moment too. The third type of wave um, is called a surface wave. And that's what we feel if you're in the area of an earthquake. Uh, that's what you, you more or less feel when the ground moves is the surface wave. So on a seismogram, you can see here, um, P wave arrived here first. Here's the secondary wave, the S wave, and the surface wave uh, that usually generates the largest uh, amplitude type of wave arriving. Um, okay. So you can actually, uh, I'm going to show you how to calculate the location of an earthquake. Of course, these days again with <laughs> The computer uh, it does it for you very quickly old days it had to be mathematically uh, determined here's another example and you will <coughs> you will notice that again here's the P wave and the S wave arriving and if you take the the, uh, the time that the difference between the arrival of the P wave and the arrival of the S wave, calculate the number of minutes, one, two, three, four, about five minutes between the two. I'll keep that in mind. Uh, so inside the Earth, as I mentioned, the P waves uh, do go through solids, gases, and liquids. So if the earthquake is large enough, a P wave can actually go through the center of the Earth and come out the other side. S waves 
will not go into our into our uh, outer core and inner core uh, because of its composition. So it's really absorbed, or it might diffract off of the uh, outer core to the surface. It's also been known in very large earthquakes, like the Indonesian earthquake a uh, number of years ago, uh, the surface wave actually went around the earth twice. That's how large the earthquake was, that the surface wave actually went around the earth twice, uh, twice to do that. So in locating a, an earthquake, uh, you need at least, preferably, three stations to have picked up the same event. You're going to use the time travel graph to determine the distance. I'll show you that in a second. And then you're going to use triangulation uh, by drawing circles around your three seismic station locations and seeing where the circles intersect to give you the location. So here's the example of the time travel graph. In this case, we have a P wave and an S wave here arriving at, at the New York, New York station in Alaska. There it is right there and in Mexico City, all recording the same earthquake, but obviously there's different times. But if you take the difference in here, and this is five minutes between here and there, take it to the time travel graph. Uh, where is five minute separation on near two lines here, the P and S lines? It's right there, drop straight down, and it's telling you from New York, it's about 3,800 kilometers, about 3,700 kilometers from New York. But you don't know what locate, you know, what direction. You do the same thing for Alaska, do the same thing for Mexico. Now you have the distances, but again, no idea of direction. So you use triangulation where you draw three circles around Nome, New York, and Mexico City, and where the three come together, that's your epicenter. Okay, like I said today, with the computer age, it can be calculated fairly quickly by the computer. You don't have to do this all this drawing. But that, in the old days, that's what, you know, seismologists had to do. Okay, the intensity. Okay, it's a measure of the degree of earthquake shaking at a given locality. And uh, the, you, you've heard of the one scale, you may not have heard of the modified Mercalli intensity scale. Um, unless you have heard me talk about it before. This is the most commonly used and certainly the one that most people uh, understand because uh, it's really based on people's reactions. It's, you know, it's, not, it's not really scientific. Okay, so on the modified Mercalli scale, uh, we have these numbers, one being the lowest and the, as we get into the 12, it uh, is total dis, uh, destruction, total damage. In a 12. For example, a three. You know, felt quite noticeably indoors on upper floors of buildings, but many people did not recognize it as an earthquake. Okay. So if we have earthquakes in this area, in the southeast Pennsylvania area, and you know when I've done a program on the Dillsburg earthquakes, uh, we spent a lot of time talking to residents, getting their reactions. What did you feel? And we when we leave that house. We have a number at their house based on this modified Macaulay. Oh, they were a three, or they might have been a four, uh, sort of thing. And we put a number, and then we're able to connect the dots afterwards and find out, based on people's reactions, where was the epicenter. Again, not scientific, but in the case of the Dillsburg earthquakes, which I will show you a diagram here in a little bit, um, residents were pretty accurate uh, with our scientific. Of course, the, the Richter scale is one that we all have heard of, but do you really understand how the Richter scale works and what it stands for, okay? Um, it's really, it's really, it, uh, it 
records the amount of energy released. Okay, so um, it's a tenfold increase. So that means that uh, a, a Richter scale three uh, versus a four, a, a four Richter scale is 10 times stronger than a three. Okay, a three to a five is 10 times 10. So it's 100 times greater. Uh, so it's a it's log rhythmic is how this does work. And uh, the Richter scale, a uh, number of ways that it can be uh, displayed. But you can see that the, uh, again, the 10 times stronger than the previous level. Small winds are very, very common in everyday life. Okay, moderate five and sixes, we call that moderate, uh, maybe occur uh, monthly around the world. And you can see every 10 years or every 30 years, major monthly every 50 years in a populated area. And of course, we get into eight, nines, and tens. Uh, it does get worse and uh, not as common. Um, Dr. Schoenberger has taught me that uh, there's no reason why we can't have a magnitude 12 earthquake. We never did. I believe the largest one recorded is a 9.2. And actually, uh, seismo seismologists have uh, have told me also that uh, you can have minus earthquakes, <laughs> which which is hard for me to comprehend. How can you have a minus one earthquake? I mean, zero is it, right? But you can actually have minus earthquakes on the Richter scale. So uh, the size of the earthquake, uh, moment magnitude, this is kind of a, a newer term. You'll see it labeled in the uh, seismology talk as MM, moment magnitude, and that's the uh, total energy released. And they figure that out by the amount of slip by the movement on the fault, uh, the area of the fault that that ruptured, and the strength of the rock, and uh, highly recommended for measuring the medium and large earthquakes. So we get to talk about ground motion and energy released. Uh, again, um, four magnitude Richter scale. Um, it's like 10,000 10, times uh, the difference in ground motion and the energy release is about a million times. 3.0 is a thousand times uh, ground motion, 32,000 times. And it gets lower as you go down to, of course, one tenth of a magnitude. Uh, ground motion is very, very small as well as the energy release. Uh, with this, the Hiroshima atomic bomb was a 6.5 on the Richter scale. Uh, how that falls into into all this. Uh, again, uh, here's the magnitudes out here, average per year. See that we have like an eight, might have an average of one per year. Uh, Chile in 2010, the seismogram I showed you earlier. Uh, Mexico City in 1980. Uh, I, I actually I, I remember that because I was teaching at your college uh, at that time. Uh, the amount of energy released just phenomenal. And you see as we decrease in magnitudes, numbers of occurrences per year go up. 1.3 million, maybe 2.2 to the 3.0 earthquakes each year. So uh, they they do exist. They and they do happen. Uh, earthquake destruction, as you know, okay, it it really de uh, depends on uh, the intensity of the earthquake, the duration of the vibrations. How long did those vibrations last, or did they come in different uh, sets or different uh, sequences? nature of the material used in the structure. Um, 
course, a concrete building is going to withstand better than a, um, a wooden structure. Uh, mobile homes are always good for feeling very light earthquakes compared to a, a brick and mortar house. Uh, so the design and the material plays a big role in, uh, in this case, structural uh, damage. Ground shaking obviously does much damage. The wave amplification, uh, as the uh, ground does uh, move, um, the wave, and then we have the li liquid faction of the ground, where the where the ground becomes saturated like mud, and uh, things become come to float, or actually uh, underground objects may uh, come up from the subsurface to the surface and float because the soil has become totally saturated uh, and and does uh, move. Landslides and ground subsidence are very obvious things that happen. Uh, landslides are, are triggered by earthquakes. Uh, of course, fires, they have gas lines that might rupture. Uh, and other fires, of course, the threat of a tsunami, um, particularly if it happens uh, in a, um, a subduction zone where that plate is going down beneath. Uh, tsunamis uh, do occur uh, when there's actually a rebound uh, of the uh, of the crust, where it actually you know, gets pushed down by by uh, the, the faulting. And then actually rebounds up back up, and that's what forms the tsunami. And of course, today the Pacific Ocean has a wonderful uh, tsunami war warning system. As uh, it, you know, the other the other uh, week when we had the volcanic eruption in the South Pacific Ocean, which did actually create the volcanic eruption and actually created a, a tsunami along with the minor earthquakes they had, but uh, they were sounded uh, into California and Japan, as well as South America. Here's a picture of liquefaction, where these buildings simply slid because they did not have a solid ground any longer. And uh, the unconsolidated sediment became, like, like I said, quicksand. And that did cause uh, serious damage. Predicting earthquakes. Um, there's no really reliable method that's been devised yet. Uh, you can do some. You can do some calculating, as it says here, by recording. Uh, if you want to call them force shocks. Uh, watch the ground elevation change, uh, particularly like along the San Andreas Fault. Uh, just keep monitoring the ground level. If, if uh, things are changing fairly rapidly, uh, that could be a, a precursor to a major or a, an earthquake. There's a thing called a paleo seismology. Of course, you study the past earthquakes. You know how they behave along a certain area, uh, sort of thing, and uh, you can kind of calculate. Well, 250 year, years ago, you had a there was a major earthquake that did this much damage. So uh, actually, seismologists, paleo seismologists, are looking at soils that were formed as a result of those earthquakes. So they're really uh, they're looking, they're studying the past earthquake history a thing called seismic gaps this is a this is one that's pretty um, easy to understand uh, again pick on the San, San Andreas fault if a San Andreas fault had an earthquake at point A had an earthquake at point B but nothing in between uh, you could predict well A and B move but C in between hasn't moved for a while that's perhaps where the next earthquake could happen. Okay. Now I did also read that um, the United States Geologic Survey 
in California has been pumping uh, water into the San Andreas Fault in s some of these uh, they call seismic gaps to slowly move the San Andreas Fault by adding uh, liquid to it, moisture, let, to let it slip slowly instead of having a major slip. So they've been trying to uh, they've been trying to uh, produce small, numerous small earthquakes in lieu of the big ones. Of course, the earthquake hazards, I'm going to show you some maps here soon, uh, but the earthquakes uh, don't kill people, buildings kill, kill the people. So again, it's important and, uh, that building codes are followed, uh, which they certainly are, uh, being done in big cities that have prone uh, earthquake possibility, uh, earthquake resistant structures. Anybody has been to the York County area, you've been to the Galleria Mall. Uh, when they built the mall, um, people got a little perturbed <laughs> because when you, because the mall floor does move. And uh, there was some, uh, <laughs> there was some pretty cool stuff that residents were not happy with the Galleria Mall not being built right. It's actually earthquake uh, resistant, and that's why it was doing what it was doing. So, uh, as it says there, the earthquake warning systems measuring uh, P waves shuts down the infrastructure in Japan immediately. That's their prevention. Uh, so, if the whole system shuts down, the infrastructure shut down, they know uh, what has come or is coming or might have come. All right. Seismic hazard. There's there's different maps uh, out there for seismology. Seismic hazard is a map that's showing you where the possibility of an earthquake is better than others, other areas. Okay, so for example, the red, you know, the San Andreas Fault along the California coast, primarily, certainly is a prime area. We have the New Madrid area uh, down in here, which actually has produced some, uh, back in 1811, 1812, produced uh, several big earthquakes that actually rerouted the Mississippi River. Uh, some good reading there if you like novels and things. Uh, find, a, find one of the books written about uh, New Madrid earthquake. And then uh, we have this part in uh, uh, North Carolina, Tennessee border, and then Charleston, South Carolina, for example, uh, is sitting in a prone area. We in Pennsylvania, at least where where we're we're located uh, in the southeast, we're you know in kind of a, a moderate area for a possible earthquake. The blue area, not much of a chance of a of a serious earthquake occurring, like where Mike Bear is and and uh you guys out there okay the forecast this is actually the the forecast of uh of earthquake shaking capability okay if they have an earthquake is there going to be a lot of shaking taking place and it pretty well corresponds to the hazard map i just showed you new madrid and of course you got california here's charleston and uh again the eastern Tennessee seismic zone, and again, we in southeast Pennsylvania are in that moderate, uh, they call it medium area. We would have some shaking. This is put out by FEMA uh, not too long ago. And then the damage map, the earthquake risk map. Who's going to have a lot of damage if we have uh, a major earthquake? Obviously, you see Texas and this in the green areas, Florida, no damage. California, major, particularly the southern half of California. Uh, you have this belt coming through here in the Rocky area, Rocky Mountains area on the uh, Colorado Plateau. Here's the New Madrid again, Charleston, and the moderate does extend the whole way out into Tennessee and just 
into Pennsylvania a little bit. Uh, so we would not expect a lot of damage here uh, in uh, Pennsylvania in this case. So let's look at a couple of uh, local earthquakes in Pennsylvania. This is a um, earthquake map of Pennsylvania in history up until about 2010, I think, or so. Uh, but you see that the earthquake county capital of Pennsylvania appears to be Lancaster County. Uh, I'm not going to get into the geology of why, but you know, there's been there are some faults in here that have been that do move and have moved. And uh, over in the Brooks County, somebody actually has uh, labeled this as the uh, Lancaster seismic zone around Lebanon and in the Reading area, that sort of thing. You might remember what four months ago or so, Sinking Springs in near Reading, uh, right here, had had another earthquake. A couple up around Lehigh County, uh, out in the coastal plain, uh, north of Philadelphia area, and the largest earthquake in Pennsylvania to ever hit. Is that is this dot right there where my pointer is? Honda Tuning, Pennsylvania, I think it was 1998, was a 5.2 on the Richter scale. That was the largest earthquake in Pennsylvania. Of course, my pride and joy, Dillsburg uh, earthquake swarm is represented by one dot in Northern York County. 1970 to 2015, uh, these are the earthquakes. <laughs> that have happened. Uh, Pontatuning is this one right here, uh, sort of thing. You see that uh, uh, Brooks County has had uh, several larger earthquakes, also down in the Lancaster, uh, sort of thing, where I just highlighted to you. Over in the New Jersey, where Kathleen is located, uh, has of course some earthquakes out there, and of course down in the Maryland. Uh, west of uh, Baltimore uh, is one one area. Um, the Ramapo Fault, uh, it's nicknamed uh, the border fault between the Triassic, uh, I should say the Mesozoic uh, rocks and older rocks, uh, runs down through this into central Pennsylvania. This has been a, a producer of some earthquakes, uh, particularly up in the up into uh, New, you know, uh, toward New York State and uh, New Jersey, and uh, the even the Silver Sp uh, the ones around uh, Reading uh, are related to the Ramapo Fault sort of thing. I like that one. We will rebuild, though. Yep. All right, so this is a seismogram. This is one from Dillsburg, uh, October 19th, 2008, as recorded, <laughs> as recorded in uh, Millersville. 1.9 and a 2.1. And, uh, you know, when Dr. Schoenberger first looked at this. <coughs> he thought there was, he, he thought that this was one earthquake. But then there's quiet time, about 15 seconds between, to make it two different earthquakes. So using the modified Mercalli scale, this is Dillsburg again. We drew the lines. After all the interviews were done, we connected the dots and we came up with in this area, in the four, Marcali scale four, is where we think the epicenter occurred. And after we got the uh, records and the recordings from the seismographs uh, uh, mapped, uh, they were right in that same area. So the people in here felt a four, a three, two, and a one. And as I mentioned before, if you didn't, didn't feel anything, it was important. You were outside the 
the uh, any you know the the zone of uh, filming anything unless you had a, a specialized house. <coughs> Here is the here's the seismogram. This is the again the computer plotted the earthquakes for us from our stations that we did have. So this is uh, e equal to the the four that uh, I just showed you on the Mar Mar Marcoli scale. The uh, four white triangles was one seismic system that we had set up for the four different stations. And then the black triangles, which we're covering up one there. Uh, the other three were another time that we had seismographs in the area recording. So anyway, uh, computers these days makes it a lot easier. 3.4 magnitude, you might remember this. Uh, I threw this in. This is out uh, uh, in Juniana County, the Perry County, Juniana County line. Uh, 3.4 is rather large for Pennsylvania. What made this an interesting though is it was, uh, it was calculated to be 16.8 miles deep. In Pennsylvania, most of the earthquakes occur um, usually um, two to three miles deep. And why this one was so deep, uh, really, there's no answer for that yet. But that was just kind of an interesting one that occurred um, 2019. Um, these days, again, with the computer, if you feel an earthquake, you can go on to the United States Geologic Survey website for earthquakes and find the earthquake that you felt and plug in your zip code and it will show up on a map. So this is actually one of the 2009 uh, Perry County, Juniana County line earthquake and all of the people in this region felt it. Okay, so no need for us to go out and survey people because they can do that on their own these days with this technology. So uh, if, there, if there's an earthquake, you, you, know, you can go check us out a um, number of hours afterwards, of course, give people a chance to see their reactions or report their findings. As I mentioned earlier, there is the Pennsylvania State Seismic Network now set up um, that you can go and see real time earthquakes. And uh, this is an interesting fact that uh, I just put out there. There's been 34 earthquakes in Pennsylvania since 2014. I see that uh, uh, if you compare that to the history log of earthquakes in Pennsylvania, that's a good many earthquakes in that in that time between 2021 and 2014, uh, sort of thing. So, and these are these are tectonic earthquake earthquakes. These are real earthquakes. Because I'm going to talk. I'm going to end the program here by talking about not true earthquakes. Uh, but according to Dr. Schoenberger, who, by the way, I acknowledge the fact that he has taught me a heck of a whole lot of stuff in our, in our years that we've known each other, uh, there's a 60% probability of a 6.0 quake in our area in the next 200 years. So there's your probability. Dr. Schoenberger is a great probability person figuring out uh, these formulas. So. 60% uh, probability that we could have a 6.0 earth, oh, earthquake in our area. So uh, just keep that in mind, okay? Uh, question may also come forward. Um, why are East Coast earthquakes felt over a wider region than the West Coast earthquakes? And uh, kind of put it as simply as we, as we can, we have bedrock in our, on our east coast, except for the coastal plain uh, sediment over top of bedrock. Everything else is totally bedrock. Out in California, they have unconsolidated material. They don't really have much bedrock out there. But the seismic waves, the P wave, the S wave, the surface waves, they are transmitted better, thus longer distances through bedrock 
than they are in, in unconsolidated material. So that's why, again, again, in California, when they get a 5.0 earthquake, it doesn't affect a huge region compared to our 5.0 earthquake that we have on the East Coast. You know, take that back into, remember the uh, Virginia, Mineral Virginia earthquake, I think, what, 2011. Um, 5.3 is Virginia, but here in southeast Pennsylvania, we felt it like a 3.0 earthquake. Uh, so, and it, it felt the whole way up into New, New England states because we have bedrock compared to the California unconsolidated material. All right, I want to end with um, fracking and earthquakes. Okay, and uh, as you might be aware, uh, I like to get a program on here of a, a fracking program sometime. Um, I'm not I'm not qualified to really give a good fracking program. Uh, I need to find somebody who who can. But anyway, fracking going on in central Pennsylvania, uh, where they are getting down into those called the Marcellus Shale and pumping out the uh, gas. Uh, injecting, they are injecting uh, uh, chemicals into the ground to make that happen. And uh, in the red are the Marcellus uh, shale wells that have been drilled. And the blue is the uh, shale wells that have been drilled, uh, not in the Marcellus. Uh, you know, for, like for for the gases and, and the oil. So you can see where the Marcellus is, is being uh, commercialized basically at this point, as long as Pennsylvania still allows Marcellus to be produced. Maryland has made a mar fracking uh, uh, no longer available. I'm not sure about New York. I know they were on, New York was considering or shutting down the Marcellus uh, fracking because of uh, environmental concerns. So February 2013 to 2015, uh, there's these earthquakes, okay? And uh, these are these are almost uh, caused due to fracking. Um, these are not. If you look at the, the Pennsylvania State Seismic Network uh, map, they do divide them up. Non-tectonic earthquakes compared to tectonic earthquakes. So there are non-tectonic earthquakes every day in Pennsylvania uh, occurring in Pennsylvania. So fracking does, and has been proven actually in Ohio, Oklahoma, and Colorado that fracking does cause earthquakes. Uh, so it's not surprising, you know, that, that it's, it's going on. <clears throat> so with that in mind, <coughs> I sent out an exercise for you folks to work on if you wanted to, on the uh, Mercalli uh, scale to label uh, based on the information that was on the cue cards, each one of these stations had a had a, a description by a person at those stations. And you can assign each one of those uh, X's a number on the mo modified Macaulay scale called the, uh, the color sheet. And this is what your map should have looked like if you did your exercise, did your homework. Okay, so right in here, uh, just north of Wattsville is where the highest intensity was. It had eights on the modified Mercalli scale. Seven, sixes, the zone of five, and the fours out here. So, so this is actually an exercise that my my college class will will be doing uh, as a audience participation type of exercise using the calling cards. So with that, I'm going to. Stop the screen, get back to all y'all. And uh, we had maybe a, we 
You might have had a nice ground shaking uh, program there. Anybody have any questions or anything? Here. Yeah, Kathleen, go ahead. Um, how come there's an S wave if the other wave is the surface wave? Oh, well. What, what does P stand for? Uh, S stands for the secondary. Because we had the primary wave and the secondary wave and then the surface wave. And wh why is it important to gauge between the primary wave and the secondary wave? Uh, What's well, the time of arrival that really lets the computer decide or determine how far away the earthquake happened when the P wave okay. arrived and the S wave? Okay. okay, and then after the S wave, it, is it, do you draw the line up for the surface wave? Is it do they more or less do a line and then up and it's no <laughs> no surface wave is uh, is what we feel if we're in an earthquake event and how long is that from the secondary wave it really depends on the distance that you are from the earthquake oh okay obviously the further away you are the longer it's going to take that surface wave to get to you what did you say the what it's going, to, it's going to take the surface wave longer to get to you if you're if the uh, earthquake's further from the recording station. Recording station? Yeah, like the, the seismograph. Oh, because I'm thinking of the Richter scale. Oh well, yeah. What's that? That's that's the magnitude. That's the intensity. One way to measure the intensity of the of the earthquake. Yeah, because I found it interesting that. The primary wave would go through liquid. What is it? Sound and what? What else? Uh, gases. Gases. Anything. The primary goes through anything. But the secondary only goes through what? The solids like rock. Oh, so the the secondary only goes through solids. Uh, right. Yep. It's absorbed. That is so interesting. It's, it's absorbed in liquids and, and gases. Then what is the uh, the vibration when we feel go through the, that, what is it called? Surface wave. The surface wave. What does yeah. that go through? Uh, pretty much everything on the, on the surface. Oh, where we live on the cross, huh? Right, right. Yep. Okay. Great presentation. Thank you. Any other questions or anything? Um, we did have one in the chat. You kind of answered it. Um, what kind of waves, earthquake waves, produce tsunamis? And must they be of a certain strength to produce a tsunami? Uh, it has to be a, a, a large earthquake, uh, maybe 6.0 or greater. And like I mentioned, uh, you know, in the subduction zone, it's a, it's a release uh, when the, when the uh, when the earthquake happens, the crust is pushed down, but when it rebounds, it goes back up. It's like taking your hand and, uh, and pushing it back up. And that's what creates the tsunami right there is when the crust rebounds back up to its original uh, location. Uh, so the larger the uh, displacement, the uh, higher possibility of a tsunami forming. We will never have a tsunami in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of North America because we don't have a uh, subduction zone or thrust faulting taking place. Good question. That's good. Is surface damage usually or always at the epicenter or at the fault of the center? I missed that first part. What'd you say? Oh, just oh, a sec. Surface damage. Okay. Yeah. Is it usually or always at the epicenter or at the fault at the center? Well, remember the fault is uh, faults uh, under the epicenter. Um, your most damage is going to be at the epicenter, uh, unless there's something weaker further out. Um, so yeah, you can actually, if you don't, oh, um, you're gonna you're gonna be able to judge your 
epicenter by where the most damage is, uh, generally speaking, uh, sort of thing. And talking about your questions, if we have a tsunami from the earthquake, is it because there were uh, recent puddles or sinkholes or uh, different uh, places where water collected and wasn't able to get out that it eventually yeah, yeah not really. The tsunami How does that work? Tsunamis in the ocean. There's going to be created in the ocean. Oh, so, so tsunamis get created in the ocean? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then what, then what happens to the land uh, sinkholes during the earthquake? Well, earthquakes could open sinkholes up, um, more sinkholes up. They could actually enlarge sinkholes. Um, that ha that's happened here in uh, Lancaster County before with uh, sinkhole activity after an earthquake. Um, so, you know, that, that could be one of the after effects of, of an earthquake is, uh, you know, sinkholes, uh, caves could collapse. And does that cause a lot of flooding? No, not really. No. It can also uh, disturb the groundwater. Um, that one I showed you, uh, referred to the Mexico City 1980 earthquake in Mexico City. I remember that a well, a well in, uh, where was that? Well in Virginia, the mm -hmm. groundwater literally shook back and forth for a couple of days because it, it, uh, it got disturbed. So, wow. all right, any other questions coming in? Um, could a tsunami, tsunamis be created by volcanic action or large landslides in the Atlantic? Uh, it would have to be a super large uh, landslide to displace the ocean enough and, and speed to send that tsunami uh, wave outward. Um, usually not. You need that. You need that rebound. Hmm. Do you know of any effort to shut down fracking in Pennsylvania? Uh, let me read. Is that question again? I didn't see it. Okay. Uh, do you know of any efforts to shut down fracking in Pennsylvania like they did in Maryland? Uh, there's no effort of doing that uh, for one reason or another. I think Pennsylvania is making too much money on uh, on, on fracking, uh, but uh, yeah, there's all kind of bad stories about the environmental reactions of what's going on with the with the fracking. Well, before I get to Andrew's question, Stephen made a good point that um, there was that recent eruption in Tonga that created the tsunami. But that was in the Pacific. Right. Question asked specifically about the Atlantic. Jerry, isn't it one of the, I think, the Cape Verde Islands that is um, separating? And they are concerned that a volcanic action is going to cause a good chunk of the island to slide into the Atlantic. Right. That, that's uh, apparently happening now, as I understand it. It's rifting apart. Yeah, it's, a, it's a rift. And that, that's on that's on one of the that's on the uh, mid oceanic ridge. So yeah, that's 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 a true statement. That's large enough to create create a tsunami. Uh, potentially. Potentially, it could. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, does global warming have any uh, problem or result with? Or, or a bunch of this water and melting and no. an earthquake like thing because there'll be have, more water that doesn't have anything to do do with earthquakes yeah yeah all right i'm sure andrew saw me shaking my head i was gonna say we're gonna get more <laughs> flooding from it all you know added flooding right oh the sea level will uh, will, will rise can I ask, um, 
when I was looking at like your map of your uh, the earthquake swarm in the Dillsburg area, the one thing that struck me, you know, the um, lines of equal intensity, how part of it, there was a very quick drop off in the lines. In other words, the lines were close together in one direction, but spread out in another. Can you use that kind of information to infer things about the geology of an area? Oh, yeah, that was uh, what I showed you uh, was elongated, elongated uh, more or less east to west. Yeah, east to west, uh, which would be kind of the direction uh, in be the line of strike with the uh, the diabase intrusion that that's under that area. Uh, another one that we did uh, actually had a very clear southwest northeast orientation, which would uh, would be the the uh, in parallel with the the bedding of the, the strike of the rock uh, for that one. But the one I did show you is east and west, which would be the uh, diabase intrusion uh, strike. All righty, Andrew would like to know. How do they rule out human made small earthquakes, the ones not reported by mining companies blasting? Because his, him and his friends may have caused one in West Virginia a few years back. Uh -oh. Not saying how, lol. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, these, uh, these earthquakes that are happening through fracking are, are small, uh, usually less than two. Uh, but they're being recorded by the Pennsylvania State Seismic Network, and uh, and you know they can tell by the record that comes onto the computer if it's a man-made or no non non-tectonic or a tectonic earthquake. Um, same as a quarry blast. When a quarry blasts, it creates a P wave, S wave, and a, a, a surface wave. But again, it's how it did, how it arrives at your size mile at your 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 seismograph. Was it man made or natural made? So the people at Penn State with the network, you know, can tell that just by the arrival of those waves. Um, so yeah, um, many many earthquakes are being produced by by the fracking. Uh, what about isostasy, or I guess like isostatic rebound? Is that what you mean? <laughs> rebound, yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, it's been it's been proven. I know uh, there was a case up in Sinking Springs, outside of Reading, uh, many years ago, where they where they actually dewatered a quarry to put it back in operation, and by taking the weight of the water off the rock, the limestone did produce a, an earthquake. Uh, because there's less weight on me, you take the weight off of me, I can stretch. Okay. And, uh, and it moved. And actually, when that quarry closed down, uh, again, uh, it did uh, fill back up with water. And there was another earthquake. But now we put more weight back on that limestone and the limestone pushed pushed back down. So uh, yeah, we think we think southeast Pennsylvania is rebounding. Um, that's why you know that the theory is that that's why we don't see a lot of erosion happening along the Susquehanna River cutting into the landscape because the down cutting uh, force is about equal to the to the rebound, isotopicity re rebound. Uh, so it's like neutral right now. Is is there any way they can uh, take the water out of the quarry if it goes too high, or uh, how how does uh, the the water level in the quarry get controlled with rain with the rain and uh, and water, water levels going up. 
actually the or earthquakes. Actually, the groundwater water shaking. The groundwater will will only come up a certain elevation because of How the, did, of the the the, uh, the pressure of the groundwater. It will only, only come up to a certain ele elevation before it doesn't come any higher. If it's an if it's an active quarry and they need to use the floor of the quarry, they will have pumping systems and they'll pump the water out to what they call retention ponds. Oh, okay. So I'm just curious, how come when I go to the quarry swim club, the water does not get any higher than a, uh, any deeper than uh, what it originally <laughs> is? What's happening there? You said something about the pressure? Yeah, there's a pressure line that the water will not come up to its, above a certain elevation. Why not? Why, why, what's the point of the pressure line? What does the pressure line do? Well, the, that dictates the, uh, the height of, of, the, of the water table. Uh, so that's why most quarries don't overflow because a pressure line uh, Shuts, uh, off, shuts off the, uh, the the groundwater at that point. So, uh, but uh, does that happen with the ocean or? Oh, uh, well, in, in, in a sense it would, yep. Uh, All right, any other questions? Um, Stephen just has a little fact for us. The Laituya Bay in Alaska in 1958, created by a landslide, washed waves up the mountains to a height of 1700 feet which is pretty crazy grief. <laughs> and uh, that's about it for questions and everything however paul would like to make a free program announcement before we quit for the night yeah, i just wanted to let everybody know if you're interested tomorrow evening i am doing an online program it's not about geology it's actually called animal prognosticators. It's about four animals that we look to to try to tell the weather forecast. Things like groundhogs and other animals like that. Uh, if you're interested in it, uh, I am doing it uh, with my fellow person, uh, Mindy, down at Little Buffalo State Park. So either go to the Penn State Calendar of Events or the Facebook page for Little Buffalo State Park. Look for the program Animal Prognosticators. Uh, it is free, but you will have to sign up for it. And instead of Zoom, it'll be through Microsoft Teams because in state parks, we're not allowed to initiate programs over Zoom. So we have to use Microsoft Teams. But it is free. Um, and there is instructions there about what to do to be able to watch it. So it's a fun program. If you're interested in it, it'll be at six o'clock tomorrow evening online. All right. Um, would you please give me information on how to access the program? Just go to like Facebook and look up Little Buffalo State Park and then look for the program in the post and that will give you the information. I don't have the information directly to send anyone, but it's all there. Nice background. <laughs> all right, so all kind of leads me into my final joke for tonight. What do you get when you uh, combine Bambi with a ghost? You're right, it's called bamboo. Bamboo, okay. Brittany, take us out of here. Thanks for joining us tonight. Oh, thanks everyone, that was really fun. I hope everyone had a good time. We'll see you in two weeks. Everyone stay safe out there. See ya. Bye.